Ron Romanelli here from PickDogs.com. Here with your Week Eight college football show. Oh boy, Ron, it, it's crazy. You blink, and all of a sudden we are after this week more than halfway to Championship Sunday or Championship Saturday. So, yeah, it's a little bit crazy. How you doing? I'm doing good, Chris. I'm not sure if I'm on the screen. Um, at least I don't see myself on the screen. Is it preview mode or? Oh no, no, no. sorry. I was having this issue with Jay earlier. You're good. Unfortunately, I couldn't fix the uh, fix the so where you see the screen. But trust me, we're. Oh, good. okay. But I'm on there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're good. No, we're good. <laughs> good. Okay. Yeah, I'm doing well. Uh, yeah, you know, I'd say it's a it's an okay college card this week. You know, there's it's obviously Penn State, Ohio State's the big game of the week, but not a ton of you know great games entertainment wise. Some good value spots, but um, I would say last week was this was definitely the better card. Yeah, I know for sure. Um, I, it's weird, you know, for me the game, the the cards that I don't feel like I'm like, eh, eh, I could uh, I could take a pass on or at least go light on are the ones I end up loving the most, and the ones that I go into it thinking I love this card are the ones where I'm like, uh, maybe I don't love it as much as we start to get into uh, get into Saturday. But you're right, there are some some marquee games on there. I think we've got. Uh, let me see here. I'm just going down the list. I think at least three ranked. So we got four ranked versus ranked matchups here. Okay. I know yeah. we're. I know. I know we don't give a whole lot of merit to the rankings, and we're only a couple weeks away from the first uh, set of college football playoff rankings being released. Anyone that you see, I, I know I'm just kind of throwing this at you off off the cuff, but anyone that you see that you're you're kind of like surprised that you might see them in the playoff field, or surprised that you might not, or that they probably won't be the playoff field. Hmm. Well, let's see. So you got. Georgia, Ohio State. What's the current top four? Because I, I really don't uh, look at the ranking. Georgia, much, but... I think it's Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State, <clears throat> and Florida State. Yeah, personally, I, I don't know if Florida State has enough to to keep up. I I have just I haven't been really impressed with them at all. You know, overall this season, we've seen some tough spots like at Boston College. That game was a little dicey. Uh, I could see them taking an upset loss and and. That might be enough to take them out, even if they, you know, win the ACC. I'm not sure that you know, there's a lot of undefeated teams still. You know, that's the problem for a team like Florida State. Like, there's there's just not a lot of room for error. You know, if, if they do lose a game and Washington runs the table, which is a lot easier now with them beating Oregon, uh, I just don't know if they have an – I mean, obviously, if they go at USC in a couple of weeks, that's going to really be the deciding factor. But if they win that game, it's pretty much, you know, you run the table, you're, you're going you're gonna to make the playoffs. So – Florida State's the one team, I think. Out of the four, I think they're definitely the weaker of the four teams. Yeah, I'm with you there, and especially that the ACC doesn't tend to get a lot of credit because yeah. the ACC has been a down conference for the last couple of years, but there is some teams that are improving. North Carolina, top 10 team right now by, by virtue of the rankings, but again, you know, we have to kind of see as we as we progress. I'm a little bit shocked. I, 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 I should say this. I will be shocked if Penn State isn't in the top five once we get the first mm. – uh, First set of rankings, but again, that's how this week is going to play out because, I mean, I'll, I'll ask you for your opinion on this. If they lose to Ohio State, I know we're going to talk about this game in just a minute, but if they lose to Ohio State, does that knock them down a lot, or is it just kind of like you lost to the number three team? I think, if I think it's, it, it, in the fashion, it, it think it's all about the fashion if they yeah. lose that game. If it's like a three-point game, you don't knock it. If it's like a 48 nothing game, then... Mm -hmm. The good thing with Penn State, you know, for them is that they get a game against Michigan later on, so... They could have a redeeming, you know, game. And um, the problem is, though, that they, they all play in the, the Big Ten East. So if you lose this game, you're probably not going to make it to the Big Ten uh, championship game. So that would I, I would think if they lose this game, it's almost then pretty much not going to make the playoff. But um, I don't think they would drop too much. I still think they'd be a top 10 team and they'd have a really good chance of finishing in the top 10. But as far as playoff, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, fair enough. Well, let's not waste any more time. We'll not not filibuster anymore. We're, this show's probably going to go a little bit quicker today. Now it's just me and Ron, but uh, don't worry. Mitch will be back next week. I'm I'm probably safe to say that, but because he doesn't want, he may even be back for the for the show the, on the weekend with the sauce. But anyways, yeah. go right into it. First game on the board, just game we just talked about. Penn <laughs> State, Ohio State, one of the if not the marquee matchup on uh, on Saturday, twelve o'clock p.m. Eastern kickoff. Got Ohio State right now laying three and a half, total of 45 and a half round. What do you see here? Yeah, I like the under in this game. And I think these are two of the best defenses in college football. You could argue two of the top three defenses in college football. I don't think that's a stretch. And 
in terms, especially when you look at pass, a pass efficiency this year, these are one and two in pass efficiency defense in, in the country. So, you know, you're going to see a lot of running the ball, I think, in this game. But, I mean, Penn State's given up 2.3 yards per carry on the ground. Ohio State only 3.1. So I, I just don't think there's going to be a lot of offense. In this. I mean, you look at Ohio State, they scored 36 points per game. We've seen some really nice offensive performances. But similar to Michigan, I don't think it's been as explosive as a, of a Buckeye offense as we've seen in recent years. You know, they, they to really boost those numbers, they put up 63 against Western Kentucky, who could want to be one of the weaker defenses in college football this year. You put up 37 and 41 against Maryland and Purdue, two of the weaker Big Ten teams. So now facing Penn State, I think it's going to be a tough game offensively for the Buckeyes. Same thing goes for Penn State on the other side of their offense. I'm going to take the under here. I think this is. I think anything above 40 is some value on the under. So I'm going to go with the under in this one. Yeah, I lean towards Penn State. I think my concern here is that people see the public are going to see it's 6-0 against the spread mark and sort of hop all over that. The thing for me, though, is that, you know, has either team played the toughest of schedules? No. I mean, Ohio State, yes, they have the road win over Notre Dame, not knocking them for it, and they played well against Purdue, or excuse me, against uh, Maryland at home. But, I mean, road wins over Indiana and Purdue, eh. The, the win at home over Western Kentucky, they were always going to blow out the Hilltoppers with how little defense the Hilltoppers play. And a win over Youngstown State. It's it's nice to see those numbers where they've laid all out seventeen points or less in all their games this season. But again, take it with a grain of salt. Penn State's going to be the best team they play, but vice versa, Ohio State's going to be the best team that Penn State has played. Now we've also seen Penn State beat up on a pretty good Iowa defense. Iowa's offense was terrible, but even then, thirty-one nothing beat them at home. But outside of that, what do you have? Road wins over Illinois, Northwestern, home win, home route over UMass, win over Delaware, and. Maybe that home win over West Virginia is looking a little bit better now with how well West Virginia's played. But I think I lean towards Penn State just because they have a history of covering in this matchup and keeping things respectable. But this is the tightest spread we've seen in, let me see here, five seasons going back to 2018. Yeah. So I, I, I lean towards Penn State, but uh, probably a game I'd much rather watch than, than bet. Yeah, I think I'd honestly lean towards the Buckeyes a bit just because, like you mentioned, you know, Penn State has done well in this series against the number, but this is one of the smaller spreads we've seen in a while. I mean, the last four matchups have all been double digits. Um, and Ohio State's won all those games, but just, you know, failed to cover. But uh, I worry about Penn State's offense on the road. I think it could be – I think we see some turnovers early, and uh, I, I think Ohio State wins the game. And uh, it's a reasonable price, so I would lean towards them, and like I like that under as well. Yeah, I'll ask you just your opinion on this. Where are you with Ohio State? Like, do do you, do you are you as low on the Ohio State team as I am? With I, I just I just think it's one of the less talented Ohio State teams we've seen in a while, personally. Um, I'm not really low on them. I mean, I think the defense is the real deal, yeah. and the offense. You know, obviously, like it's not as explosive like I mentioned, but I still think it's solid. I mean, yeah. it's you know they're still putting up 300 plus passing yards in four of the last five games. The offensive line's done well. You know only given up sacks on 5.2% of passing plays. So, uh, you know, like like last year when you look at the numbers, Ohio State put up 44 points per game. Uh, the year before that, uh, 46 points per game. So it's not as potent, but it's getting the job done, and the defense has really stepped it up. So I'm still big on the Buckeyes. I think they're a playoff caliber team. Yeah, I just haven't been all that impressed with Kyle McCord, but that's, that's just personal preference. But um, move on. To our next game on the board, I feel it would be disrespectful if we didn't talk about this one at least a little bit. I uh, got Air Force and Army, the first game of the three for the Commander-in-Chief trophy. Um, you got Air Force on the road here laying 10.5. Uh, total set at 34.5. And, and, you know, the way I'm looking at it in this one, I'm going to go under 34.5, but I'm also going to lean towards Navy in the points. These games are low-scoring rock fights. And even though both of these teams are primarily option offenses that have tried to implement more of a passing game into their respective approaches this season. You know, it, both starting quarterbacks, I think it's Larrier for, for Air Force and um, I'm trying to remember the uh, the quarterback's name for uh, for Army. but Lavatai? Is maybe? it Lavatai? Um, I, th- I thought he was their starter. Was well, oh, it is, our, it, is our, it is Air Force Navy. Sorry, I put the wrong graphic yeah. up. Let me put, Uh-oh. I'm going to pull that down. Cause I thought I did these at 5 30 AM. I was a little bit tired, but um, yeah, let me, let me fix that. But um, yeah. Um, yeah. Lava tie is banged up for, for Navy. So yeah, I think they're going to go back to, to, to the offense. They, these two teams like to run, which is that um, 
that option offense I'm going to chew up a lot of clock. I could see 13-10 again. I could see 17-10, 17-13. Anyway, slice, I see it coming in under the number, and I see uh, I see Navy covering the points. Ron, what do you think? I'm going to go with Air Force here. I, I just trust them better, more on both sides of the ball, honestly. I think Navy's offense just hasn't gotten going. The triple option, you know, um, and Air, Air Force – Last week, I thought, you know, they, they got a really slow start against Wyoming. But after that slow start, they dominated the rest of the game. You know, they, I think they were down 14 nothing to start. And then they ended up winning 34-27. And it was, it was domination the rest of the game. They still outgained Wyoming by about 100 yards. And they've outgained uh, most of their – actually, every opponent they've played this year. And it hasn't been the toughest of schedules. But I think Navy's kind of one of those weaker teams that they're facing. Uh, I think Air Force, the defense, giving up only 240 yards per game. 2.8 on the ground is important, you know, against the triple option. Uh, I just think Air Force is a much better team on both sides. So I, I like them at a reasonable price. And, I, I you know, the under is always uh, worth the look when you're looking at these military games, and it's been strong in this series. So I, I think Air Force can win this game in that 21-3 to 3 range and cover this number. Yeah, I think the thing that, that, that kind of stuck out to me was just that how much these two have liked to go towards the past this season compared to past years. Um but again, it's it's sort of a shock to the system when you see, you know, Navy being forced to pass the ball a little bit here, and I don't know. It, it, it still feels weird to me that we're seeing Navy implement a bit more of a passing offense to their game. I don't know. I'm, I'm still yeah. stuck on. I, I'm still stuck on this being sort of a a, a sort of a, a slower pace game. I'm. I'm trying to finish the graphic behind the scene here just because i i don't want anyone to say that you you had the wrong graphic on the screen for this game i'm not giving anybody that's that satisfaction so um give me one sec here oh boy it's not working for me of course when i try to do something nice and it's um but yeah i think i think quarterback status if you're looking to bet this game i think quarterback status is going to be really important to yeah. to keep an eye on here um, yeah, I mean, there's not much I can, I can add to that. All right. Just so that nobody can say that I didn't, I didn't do it. <laughs> Got to understand. We'll, we'll, we'll get on to the, uh, on to the rest of it in just uno momento. Let's see here. There we go. <laughs> see production value behind the scenes. There you go. So, yeah. Ar- so Air Force and Navy. Okay. I swear to God, if I did Ar- Air Force and Army again, I would have lost it. Anyways, <laughs> we'll move on from this game. Go to our next one. Um, UCF and Oklahoma. Um, Oklahoma at home here, lane 18 and a half. Fresh off of that win, or I should say off the bye week. Prior to that, they beat uh, Texas in the Red River rivalry. UCF, I'm still trying to figure out what to make of the Knights. What do you see here, Ron? Yeah, it's been an ugly start for UCF in Big 12 play, their first season as a Big 12 program. But it looks like John Reese Plumley is going to be back for this game. And they say he's, you know, virtually 100% should be, you know, as effective as he was before the injury. And even though Timmy McClain was pretty solid, I would say, in, in terms of his play in the, in the backup role, Plumley is still the better quarterback and I think is the much better option going forward. And, you know, even though UCF's, you know, we saw it's 51 to 22, we saw the tough loss against Baylor where, you know, UCF should have won that game. And then we saw at Kansas State another blowout loss. I still think it's tough to lay a big number like this against an opponent like UCF that can run the ball efficiently and consistently. They've been able to do so all season, no matter the injuries at quarterback. Uh, UCF earning six yards of carry on the ground, about 240 uh, rushing yards per game. Oklahoma's defense has been solid. It's improved this year. But UCF, it's the strong offensive line play. Add the really strong running back group, and you get your quarterback back in Plumlee. I think UCF does enough here offensively to keep themselves in this game. The defense has been pretty atrocious lately, and they've struggled against the run, but um, I still think UCF, in a higher-scoring game, keeps this game close enough to cover this big number. I mean, they don't have to win the game outright. You're getting, what, 18 points? Uh, I think UCF, two-touchdown game. Maybe, you know, maybe they put some pressure on Oklahoma late, but at the very least, I think they cover the number. Yeah, if this game was right after the – the Red River game, I'd probably have an easier time taking UCF. I still lean towards UCF here. Um, I was initially on Oklahoma because, like Austin said in the comments, I see 6-0 with Oklahoma. 6 with Oklahoma, both straight up and against the spread. It kind of opens your eyes a little bit. But I think we just hit the bottom of the market on UCF right now. Um, you know, I, I was on the wrong side of that Baylor game. 
I was burned by it. I went against him uh, with Texas the week the following week. Came through, but like I said, now after back to back disappointments, you get your quarterback healthy, like Ron said, and it's you know once you get Plumley back, Oklahoma really hasn't seen a, uh, a, a you know a mobile quarterback to the to the level of Reese Plumley this season. I mean, I believe he saw Emory Jones against Cincinnati, but. I mean, I, I, I would take John Reese Plumley over over Emory Jones. So, uh, I think, I'm with Ryan. I think, you know, UCF, I think they do enough here to keep this one within the number. I think it's just within the number, though. I could see, you know, a 45 to 28 or 38 to 21 kind of game. So, I'm going to take UCF and the points in this one. Maybe I'll feel a little bit stronger about it as, as the weeks progress. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to lean towards UCF in this one. But, uh, move on to our next one. And now we're going to go to the 330 slot. Game between Washington State and Oregon. Oregon laying 18 and a half at home at Autzen. Um, yeah, I'm not, don't worry, P3. I'm not going to tell Dan Mullen anything that he hasn't already heard. Um, huh. uh, I'm going to go with Oregon in this one. I know it's a massive number to lay with the Ducks, and I get it. But Washington State, I don't know what to say about Washington State after getting their teeth kicked in by Arizona with a backup quarterback last week. I know Noah Fafita isn't bad. He's a decent backup for Arizona, but the way that Washington State lost that game at home was just terrible. And now you go, you know, you're for Washington State, now you're going up against, you know, a, a team that just, in Oregon, that's just rock solid defensively, top 20 against the rush and the pass, top 15 in total yardage. Um, this this Oregon offense, you know, top, best in the country in yards per rush, going up against the 75th ranked rush defense, top 10 pass offense against a uh, 120th pass defense in Washington State. I I just don't see any any other way to go here other than a comfortable Washington uh, excuse me uh, Oregon win 38 17 something like that. So give me Oregon here, big. Yeah, you know, I, it's a little disappointing that. Washington State's gotten those last two results because we're not really getting the best of them. Like, if Washington State kind of kept it close against uh, Arizona, we, this number would probably be reasonable. But now, after those two horrible performances against UCLA and Arizona, where Washington State had a combined 23 first downs in both of those games and was held to 216 yards against UCLA, 234 against Arizona, they gave up a combined 50 first downs. So they were outgained or out advantaged in the first down battle, 50 to 23 in those two games, giving up just under a thousand yards in those two games combined. It was the two worst performances by far for Washington state. So we're not getting an amazing number, but I still think Oregon wins this game comfortably. I mean, Washington state, it's crazy to think they were ranked a couple of weeks ago, but they're not playing like a ranked team at all. Oregon probably fired up after that, you know, tough loss on you know, a missed field goal against uh, Washington. It was a really great game. I mean, Oregon outgained Washington by over 100 yards. So uh, you could argue, you know, 32 to 24 first down advantage. If it wasn't for a few mistakes in the red zone and that missed field goal, Oregon should have won that game. I think Oregon wins this game. They've been horrible against the spread in this series. Washington State's been a cover machine against Oregon. But in this matchup, I, I just don't like what I'm seeing at all from the Cougars. So, yeah, I got to agree with you, Chris. I think Oregon wins in a blowout. Yeah, that I'm scared for Washington State. I think that this, the uh, the honeymoon phase is over, and I think we're going to start to see where yep. what Washington State's really made up here. But uh, moving on, now we head to the SEC. Got a uh, marquee matchup, rank versus ranger. You got the Tennessee Volunteers heading to Bryant Denny in Tuscaloosa to take on the Alabama Crimson Tide. Alabama laying eight and a half here. Uh, total set at forty eight and a half. Ron, what do you got? Man, what a tough game this one is because. On one hand, we we've talked about it all season. How Alabama's offense is not the same this year, you know, as compared to prior Alabama. I mean, last year, forty-one points per game. The year before that, forty points per game. This season, Alabama's only topped four hundred yards twice this year, and they've played some weak opponents defensively. So, I mean, they played at USF, and I know the injuries you know played a role in that with quarterbacks, but they only put up three hundred and ten yards in that game against the Bulls. So, that's you know one side of the coin. But on the other side, Tennessee, we know Joe Milton on the road. Man, he has not played well. We saw it at Gainesville earlier in SEC play. He did not have a good game. The offense uh, didn't put up, you know, 17 first downs in that one, only 16 points. So, you know, I think that there's some contradicting info in this one. I'm going to go with Bam. I just can't trust Milton on the road. I can't trust this Tennessee team on the road, even Heupel on the road, not really where I want to be. 
Uh, Bama's defense, I still think, even though the offense has been not great, the defense is still premier, one of the best defenses in college football. I think that defense leads the tide to a win and cover. Yeah, I'm. I think I'm with you here. I don't love this game, um, but this is still, like you said, a, a top top twenty five defense across the board for Alabama. Twenty first against the rush, twenty fourth against the pass, and I think we've talked about it on our Saturday shows with Kyle Kerms. I don't know what people see in Joe Milton. I I mean, you know, I'm just I'm not a Joe Milton fan. And you look at his his mark of you know um, passes downfield this season. I think going into last week, he was like 8 of 30 on pass attempts over 20 yards. And you can't go deep on this this Bama secondary. Yes, Tennessee has a decent enough offense. They're 6 in the country in rushing. But, you know, I got to take, take it with a grain of salt looking at the teams that they've played in recent weeks. I mean, you know, you got the win over Ar- uh, excuse me over uh, Texas A&M. It's all well and good. I had A&M in that one, and, and Tennessee had found a way to sneak it out late. But, you know, wins over South Carolina and UTSA. And that road loss to Florida still sticks with me. So hmm. I, I got to think, and, I, and that's their only road game this season is the road loss yeah. at Florida. So I, I got to go with Alabama here by double digits. I think, you know, I think uh, 27-17 or something along those lines, maybe 31-21, something like that. But either way, I think Alabama wins this one by 10. Probably not a game I'm, I'm rushing to the window to bet, though. But uh, moving on. Oh boy, now we get into Big Ten football. We've got uh, Minnesota paying a visit to Kinnick Stadium, taking on the Iowa Hawkeyes. One of the lowest totals you will ever see, uh, 31 and a half. And for me, I don't think you can set this total low enough. I think this one is going to be 60 minutes of mucking around between the 20s. Uh, Minnesota's offense has been terrible this season. Iowa's has been brutal going back to last year. But the thing for me is that Iowa's defense always seems to hold strong. And we saw, I think, two of the lowest totals in college football history last year with the Hawkeyes. I think both finished around 30 and a half, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I know there was a game, one of them, ironically enough, was against Minnesota. And um, there was also the bowl game against uh, against Kentucky that finished at 32. And the game against Minnesota was 13 to 10, and the game against Kentucky was 21 nothing. So... I don't know any other way to go here other than under 31 and a half. Um, maybe I lean towards Iowa because I could see a 14 to 10 win here. Um, it's a low total, but I think it's low for a reason. I'm going under, excuse me, under 31 and a half. Ron, what do you think? Yeah, I'm going to agree with you on the under. Like you said, that total for the Minnesota-Iowa game last year was 32 and a half, and the final score was 13-10, so it went well under the total. And the under's been strong in this series, and only four overs since it uh, looks like 2009. So, I mean, these teams play virtually every year. So, um, you know, Iowa's offense is in a lot worse shape now with the backup quarterback in there and only hitting uh, 38.6% of his passes. Um, Iowa's put up less than 300 yards in four straight games, and that includes that 76-yard performance against, against Penn State. And Minnesota's not a world beater defensively, but they're you know pretty solid. <clears throat> they played a pretty tough schedule, at least you know at North Carolina. A road game at Northwestern is not a you know great team, but it's still a true road game in the Big Ten. They played Michigan, so you know Minnesota's battle tested. Uh, their offense, like you said, I mean last week only 169 yards, only 52 passing yards. Kyle Manis has just not been good. In the passing game, a lot of mistakes he's made as well. Uh, I think we see a lot of running the football, a lot of clock chewing. I think it's going to be a pretty quick game, a low-scoring game, an ugly game, a game I will not be watching, and uh, I'll lean towards the under. 121st and 133rd in total offense are these two teams. <laughs> okay. That is, yeah. Well, if you like defense, this is the one for you. Or it might I don't, I don't even know if it's defense. I think it's just bad offense. Yeah, and somehow I was ranked, by the way. Yeah, I, I – 130th and 131st in terms of passing offense. Do not expect to see the ball in the air very much in this game. This is going to be a, a rock fight. But uh, anyways, we move on. And you know what? I figured you know it's time we show the Mac some love. Got some action on Saturday. But only because this is a pretty good game. Two 6-1 and one teams. It's going to have massive uh, Mac title game implications here. You got Toledo laying 2.5 on the road at Miami, Ohio. Ron, what do you see here? First of all, I think this is the first of two meetings. I think we're going to see this in the MAC championship. I think these are your top two teams in the conference. 
But I have said this from the beginning. I'm going to stick to it. I think Toledo is the best team in this conference. And I know it's a road game, but I still think we're getting the best team in this conference at a reasonable price here. I like Toledo. I think defensively this team is, you know, is, is uh, you know, has it played the toughest of schedules. I mean, when you look at UMass, Ball State, uh, Western Michigan, Texas Southern, not, not very great teams, but they're still doing great in the secondary, holding teams to 181 passing yards per game. They're active against the quarterback. They get a lot of sacks. The run defense has been solid, one of the better ones in the MAC conference, and we know this conference is not known for defense. So for Toledo to put up those solid numbers, only giving up 21 points per game, that's where you want to be. The offense for Toledo is what I really like about this team. They run the football like nobody's business, 5.8 yards per carry. They've had over 200 rushing yards in every game in the last five games, and their offensive line has only given up two sacks this entire season. 1.1% of passing plays are giving up sacks, so all the time in the world for Finn in the pocket and, and the backup quarterbacks that have had to come in as well. Um, Toledo should be able to move the ball here. Miami, Ohio's had some nice performances. They're on a nice win streak, six game win streak. They played at Miami. They played at uh, Cincinnati and they earned that outright win. So they're battle tested, but I just think Toledo is the better team in this one. So I'm going to take the Toledo Rockets and lay the points. Yeah, I'm with you. I don't think anyone can put, hold a candle to either of these teams in the Mac right now. Um, you know, Miami, Ohio, 3-0. and They're being chased by Buffalo and Ohio. Um, Toledo's being chased by Central Mich, Northern, Iowa, uh, Northern Illinois, and uh, Eastern Mich. But, yeah, I don't see I don't see how anyone catches either of these teams for the conference championship. Now, that being said, I'm still leaning towards Miami, Ohio here. Just personal PTSD, call it what you will. Now, I think Toledo should be 7-0. and I don't think they should have lost that game against Illinois. I think, you know, Toledo was the better team in that game. Um, and the performances for Toledo since have been pretty good, but I still get stuck on some of the recent performances we've seen from, from Toledo. They've dug themselves into holes against teams like Western Michigan. I remember they were down big in that game in the first half, needed a big second half to come back, and they didn't cover. They were laying 21 and a half points. They're not laying 21 and a half here, but still dug themselves in a hole, dug themselves in a hole against Northern Illinois, and then did the same against UMass on the road, and I, you know, almost got the cover there, but... I just feel that if you can't dig yourself into a hole every game and, and dig yourselves out of it, and I don't know if they'll, if that happens against Miami, Ohio, don't know if they'll be able to here. Granted, Miami, Ohio hasn't played the toughest of schedules either. You know, they have wins over UMass, Kent State, Bowling Green, Western Mish, three, three of the worst teams in uh, in the MAC this season. Um, probably not a game I'm rushing to bet. I might watch this one if, if I, you know, if I'm feeling up to it, but I still lean towards... Miami, Ohio, if this goes up to three, I'd feel a lot better about it. Two and a half is a little bit dicey for me. So uh, I can see the path for Toledo. I'm just, I'm, I'm leaning towards Miami, Ohio on the points in this one. Um, but moving on, go to, uh, we're going to go to a few games that, you know, have some uh, high ranked teams in them. Maybe not the closest spreads, maybe some underdogs coming through here. First one I'm going to look at is Texas and Houston. Uh, Texas on the road, laying 22 and a half here. Um, I'll, I'll lead the way in this one. I'm going with Texas. Um, I know Houston is a solid team, solid quarterback play, but I think this goes. I think this is just setting up for a bad spot for Houston. You've got the letdown factor in effect after such a you know crazy game against West Virginia, such an emotional roller coaster. You had Garrett Green waving to the fans on the sidelines, saying to go home when they. Scored that touchdown like 10 seconds left or however long it was. And then Houston comes down and Donovan Smith converts that Hail Mary. And all of a sudden Houston walks out with the win. Now they got to take on a Texas team that is pissed off that they lost the Red River game against Oklahoma. Uh, they're looking to make a statement here. They're going to have to make statements in conference play the rest of the way to try to impress the playoff committee. You know, to have a case, if they win the Big 12 championship, that'll go a long way towards it. But I still think you have to be able to make a case for it anyway. Style points are going to matter from here on out for Texas now that they have a loss. So I think that we see Texas put their foot in the ground here. I think Houston gets steamrolled here. I'm going Texas laying the big number. Ron, what do you think? Yeah, I believe this is a sellout crowd for Houston, but I, I just don't, I can't get there with the Cougars. I just think with this, I honestly think this is the weakest team in the conference this year. Um, I was on Houston last week, and, you know, it was a, oh, an emotional game. It, you know, they were up by 11, I think, with like three, four, five minutes left in that one. Um, and, uh, you know, and obviously the comeback, the Hail Mary, and then like, you know, Chris mentioned. But 
Houston did not play great in that game. I got to say, and they were up big in, in, in the later stages in that one, but they got outgained by over 150 yards in that one. And it, it had no sacks in the game. Their defense is one of the weaker ones in the Big 12. Texas should be able to move the ball at will in this game. Like Chris mentioned, Texas, you know, these are huge games for style points, you know, to try to impress the playoff committee after you lost to Oklahoma off a of bye week. It's just a really bad spot, I think, for Houston. Even though they have that sellout crowd, I don't think it's enough. I'm going to take Texas in a big blowout win. Yeah, this is I, – I had a feeling that, you know, this was probably going to be one of the, the quicker games we talked about, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't see any path here for, for Houston. But uh, move on to the to what I call the Ron Romanelli special. Got Michigan and Michigan State. <laughs> Michigan, Michigan. <laughs> yeah. Got uh, Michigan laying 24-and-a-half here on the road against uh, Sparty. Seen the good and bad from Sparty this season. Um, Michigan – They've won big in every game. What do you see here, Ron? I'm going to go with Michigan, Michigan, Michigan State. Give me the Spartans plus the points. This is just, I mean, Michigan State's been amazing against the spread in this series. Um, you know, Michigan's won their hand, their fair share of games outright, but Michigan State, and depending on the closing number, you know, it obviously varies from book to book, but they're 13 and 2 against the number the last 15 meetings. And we're catching, uh, what is it now, 24, you said uh, in this one? I'm seeing 24 and a half, but I've, I'm all 24 and a half. Yeah. I mean, it's just too many points for a Michigan state team. We know the offense is miserable. The coaching staff issues and you know, the, the background distractions for this program this year, but the defense is still solid. I mean, they're giving up 334 yards per game. Not bad. 3.5 on the ground. Um, they're coming off back to back big 10 games where they gave up less than 300 yards. Michigan's offense is starting to get going the last couple of weeks, you know, 52 points against Indiana and Minnesota. But overall, I still don't think this Michigan offense, similar to Ohio State, is as explosive as we've seen it in years prior. I think Michigan wins the game, and they win it pretty comfortably, but this is way too many points. We saw last year a very similar uh, spot where Michigan won the game, 29-7, to comfortable win, but they were laying 22.5 points in that game, so they failed, to, they failed to cover the number. I think we see a 21 to 24 point win for Michigan where they fail to cover that, you know, 24 and a half points and uh, Michigan state gets maybe a backdoor cover, but I think the defense keeps them in the game covers the number. Yeah. I'm, I'm there with you with Michigan state. Um, you know, Michigan's won every game of the season by 25 plus, but let's look at the teams they played and granted Michigan state, not a whole lot better than some of these, but yeah. East Carolina, UNLV, Bowling Green, Rutgers, Nebraska, Minnesota, Indiana teams that I just, <laughs> Do not see posing any sort of offensive threat against uh, Michigan. Is Michigan State going to be a threat offensively? Probably not. But this is their biggest game of the season in what looks to be a lost season. Um, Michigan, they're just trying to basically get through it. And this is a rivalry. And, you know, it doesn't take Captain Obvious to say that, but I just it's it, you have to mention it. And yeah. like Ron said, 13-2 in the last 15 meetings Michigan State is. And since 2005, we've only seen three games where the spread has been over three touchdowns, and Michigan State's covered all of them, including an outright victory back in 2020. So yeah, there's been a few upsets in this series. So as well. I think that I think Michigan State. I'm not saying they're a live dog here, but I think it's important to get on the number around 24, 24 and a half. I could see yep. 30. I could see 29, 7, 30 to 7, something similar that we saw last year. Um, yeah, I'll go 31, I'll, 10 from my final score. There you go. Uh, yeah, I, I, something like that. Three touchdowns, comfortable win for Michigan, but another rivalry cover for for Sparty here. And that's saying something because I have not backed Michigan State for much of anything this season. Yeah. Um, we'll move on. We'll go to uh, to the ACC. Got another ranked versus ranked game here. Got uh, Duke taking on Florida State. Florida State laying 14.5 points at home. Um, total set at 49.5. I couldn't get a very strong read on this game. I lean towards Florida State. Um, just because I, I haven't seen any news on Riley Leonard. There was rumblings that he could he could potentially play, I thought I saw, but maybe I'm I'm No, yeah, he's he's questionable. He could return. That's what this So yeah. if he plays, obviously he gives Duke a bit of a lift, but again, can he be a, I don't think he could be a hundred percent, could he? So it's like Florida State, they've been so strong ever since that win over Clemson. They're still unbeaten six and zero, And Florida State, like we talked about earlier, you want to talk about teams that need to, to win with style. I think Florida State is one of those teams because we've talked about the ACC doesn't get a ton of love when it comes to the playoff committee. 
A road win over Clemson's great, and then blowout wins over Virginia Tech and Syracuse is nice, but to have another win over another ranked team on your resume, I mean, I know you already beat LSU earlier in the year, but a third win over a ranked opponent would do uh, would do a lot of good for Florida State here. So I lean towards Florida State laying a big number, waiting to see if the, this comes down under two touchdowns. Um, but that's sort of where I'm at. Ron, where are you at this one? Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you guys like Duke, I get it in now. If you like Florida State, wait a little bit and see. You know, the worst that happens is Leonard is ruled out, and you're probably going to get the same price with Florida State. I, this line, to me, looks as if he's not playing. Um, but I, I honestly like Duke in this matchup. But I, I like him at the points we're, we're getting right now. You know, Duke's got a really strong offensive line and a good run game, 5.6 yards per carry on the ground this season. I know Leonard's a part of that, obviously, you know, He's got seven yards per carry himself this season. But Florida State's run defense has not been amazing. I mean, they've given up over four yards per carry. And we saw against Virginia Tech where they give up six yards per carry on the ground. So I think Duke's going to be able to move the ball enough. The defense has been solid for Duke this season. And like I mentioned at the beginning of the show when we talked about, you know, some of the playoff teams that we were a little worried about, I just haven't been wowed by this Florida State team this season. I know they're undefeated and they, you know, they've taken care of business, but you know, the close game at Boston College where they should have lost that one outright, they were outgained by over 100 yards. It needed overtime against Clemson, you know, and they out, outgained, out, well, excuse me, outgained that one by 100 yards as well. I just haven't been impressed. I mean, Florida State going into this season was like one of the more experienced teams in college football history. They like returned the entire roster but it just hasn't felt like this team is unbeatable. I, I just think Duke keeps it, keeps this one close. And if Leonard plays, it gives him a chance to maybe pull off the outright upset. But uh, I'm going to take the points here with the Blue Devils. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm leaning towards Florida State. I'm, I'm just looking at the line history and sort of where it's been moving. And it, it's never broken outside of that 13.5 to 14.5 point range. It's been fluctuating going in and out through that key number of 14, but – Nothing, uh, nothing beyond that. So depending, like Ron said, depending on where you want this line, if you like Duke, get it now. If you, if you, or maybe wait and see if the news that Leonard comes out that maybe he's not playing. Maybe it goes yeah. to fifteen. Um, but uh, if you like I Florida, did, but... yeah. But if if you like Florida State, take your chances. Maybe wait because, like I said, it's been moving all over the place. So. Yeah, I mean the worst thing is with Florida State. Like right now, it's fourteen and a half across the board. It's a couple fifteens. If Leonard's ruled out, what's the worst that happens? It goes to 15 and a half. I mean, it's, you're, you're still past the key number of 14. So I'd be waiting if I was a Seminoles backer, but that's not who I am. I'm a Duke yeah. backer. Give me the blue devil. <laughs> I could I could honestly, and I know I might catch some flack for saying I could see it moving to 16 and a half. And still that. I mean, anything below 17, if I'm on Florida State, I'm fine with. I mean, you want yeah. the, obviously the best number possible. But information in this case with a you know, quarterback and Riley Leonard who's really solid i mean one of the better quarterbacks in the acc it's yeah. important to, to get that info so i'll be waiting on this one and uh you know hopefully we can update you guys and uh um on the saturday morning show yeah but uh, moving on more acc action a pair of unranked but i thought this was an interesting matchup on the board you got clemson and miami a pair of two lost teams going at it in this one uh clemson laying three on the road at miami uh ron do you see anything in this game I, I like the Canes. You know, I'm interested to see what Mitch says about this one because he was, uh, you know, you know Miami Mitch, but um, he was not fond of my of the Canes last week. He said they were in trouble against North Carolina, and it looked like Miami was hanging in there at the beginning, but obviously losing that game and failing to cover in the end, 41-31. But I, I just think Miami, when you look at those two games, they were negative seven in a turnover differential in those games, negative three against Georgia Tech negative four against North Carolina. We know the coaching gaffe in that game against Georgia Tech was the reason they lost that one. They should have won that game. They outgained Georgia Tech by over 200 yards. Just a horrible mistake at the end of that ball game. Then it was a really tough spot, you know, off the disappointing result, going to North Carolina, facing an explosive offense. But now you're back home, and I know the home field advantage for Miami is not amazing usually because it's, you know, the stadium's Hard Rock Stadium's not on campus. But for a game against Clemson, this is still a huge game for the program. Clemson has not wowed me offensively this season. You know, we talked a lot about how now DJU's at Oregon State. We got Klubnik, who's you know everybody's been waiting for for years. He's going to be the explosive quarterback that Clemson needs, similar to T. Law. But that hasn't been the case. I mean, there's been decision making issues. The offense has put up only over 425 yards twice this year. One of those games was against Florida State. The other one against Charleston Southern. So you know the, the offense hasn't been amazing. The defense is your typical strong Clemson defense. But I think Miami can compete there. They have a good offensive line, a great run game. I like Van Dyke at quarterback. I'm going to take Miami in this one. 
Yeah, I went back and forth on this one. I lean towards Miami, um, just because I if it, if it's not now for Miami, when? Um, yeah. But I mean, I don't, I don't have a strong feeling on this game. I, mean, I I just still stick with, or what's stuck in my head is still that that narrow win over Wake Forest for Clemson at home, that seventeen to twelve win. I haven't been a Kate Klubnik fan all year long. Um, yeah. You know. I, like I said, I just I can't get there with with Clemson, but I've been wrong on so many Clemson games this season that I, I <laughs> I've kind of written myself off on those. So, um, to me, it's strictly just a lean towards Miami. But probably not a game I'm rushing to the window to bet personally. Yeah, and Austin mentions you know that after that uh, Georgia Tech debacle, the wheels are falling off. We kind of saw that last year with Miami when they lost that game against Texas A and M, and they got upset by Middle Tennessee, and then it was just a nightmare season after you know a strong start against weaker teams, but. Um, I don't know. I, I think this is kind of a um, a critical moment for Crystal Ball and the program. I mean, there's there's obviously some optimism going forward with the recruiting, but I mean, how many good recruiting classes can you get and bad teams are you gonna have on the field before it's enough? You know, I, I think this is a really big game for Miami, and uh, you know, I don't think the season's over in terms of what you know getting to a New Year's Six Bowl or something. If they run the table, they could certainly do that. They got Florida State and, and Tallahassee later this season, so. This is a big game, and I think Miami shows up for this one. Yeah, it's definitely a, uh, a matchup. I'd say it's a uh, lot of intrigue to, to to put it to put it nicely. But um, we'll move on. Two more games left, and this one's one I'm looking forward to. Uh, you got Utah paying a visit to uh, the Memorial Coliseum, taking on USC. USC laying seven here. Total set at forty eight and a half. Um, at least I think that's what it is. Let me make sure I have that right. Anytime I see a, a USC total that's under. 50. No, I, I see 54. I, 54, yeah. I, I think I left this in from the last slide. Again, it was 5.30 a.m. Cut me a break. Um, but <laughs> but um, I'll say that I'm I'm going to be on USC here. Um, for me, there's just so much going in favor of the Trojans here. It's a double revenge spot you know, for, for USC after losing both games to Utah last season, including the Pac-12 championship. Um, U, USC needs a bounce-back performance after that terrible game against... Uh, Against Notre Dame. And I know that you can gash this USC defense. That's all well and good. But the only quarterback that I want to try to gash this USC defense is Cam Rising. And I'm not going to keep diving on grenades with Utah in the hopes that I finally get on the one game where he actually comes back. Because, you know, there's been rumblings in the last couple weeks that he's going he's gonna to make his surprise return. Kyle Whittingham is keeping it close to the best. And he's going to play and he's going to surprise everybody. I'll believe it when I see it. Until then, I got to assume it's either Bryson Barnes or Nate Johnson. Neither one of them have been spectacular. And I just, this this Utah defense is a totally different team when you take them outside of Rice Eccles. Um, yeah, they're second in stopping the rush. But they're just inside the top 50 in terms of the pass, in terms of pass defense. And this is a USC offense that marches up and down the field. I think if you want to talk about a team that needs wins with style points, you know, you got to go look at USC here, especially if you have to try to leapfrog Washington and Oregon, you need all the help you can get here. So I'm, I'm going USC here. I'm not overthinking it. I Like I said, until I see Cam rising back for Utah, I'm not going to believe it. So give me USC. Ron, what do you think? Yeah, you know, if I had went into a coma last week and somebody told me, Ron, Notre Dame beat USC 48-20, to 20, I would have said, ah, you know, Caleb Williams, he, he tried his best, but the defense just couldn't bail him out. And, you know, that's why USC lost that game. But that wasn't the case. Caleb Williams and the offense was they were horrible in that game. I mean, plainly put, five turnovers or negative five in the turnover battle. They had six sacks allowed. And, you know, the offense, while they put up some garbage time yards and points late in the game, you know, it was it was a horrible offensive game plan for USC. The defense was actually pretty solid. I mean, they only gave up 250 yards, and I know a lot of that was because Notre Dame had short field, uh, you know, opportunities. But Notre Dame really was not moving the ball much in that game. That their, their offense was their defense, and that's important to win football games. But – Going forward, I'm less worried about this USC defense now after seeing a pretty good performance on the road. And I'm also not too worried about the offense because while it was a horrible performance, you know, you're back at home now. You know, Caleb Williams is still the best quarterback in college football. This offense should be able to bounce back. I mean, it's been so strong all season. I think it was more just a fluke, a tough spot in South Bend. It's never easy playing there. Now you're back home. Like Chris mentioned, it's a really bad spot for Utah. Double revenge game. Um, you know, USC's fired up after the blowout loss. I think we see USC settle down, win this game comfortably. I've been a cr- pretty critical of Utah all season, especially when they're on the road. We, we saw them at Oregon State, a horrible performance there. I think we see USC 
bounce back, win this game comfortably. Yeah, I, like I said, I'm just done trying to catch falling knives with Utah and trying to figure out when Cam Rising is going to play. That's that's <laughs> pretty much the long and short of it with me. But um, our last game on the board, 10-30 game. I don't want to leave the 10-30 slot completely untouched, and uh, we still have a top-five team playing at 10-30 Eastern. Got Washington at home, laying 27-and-a-half against uh, Arizona State. Ron, is there any any angle that you like in this game? Anything you can see here? I like the under. You know, Washington's offense has just been unreal like USC uh, all season, 44 points per game, and Michael Penix having a great year. But to me, Arizona State – or excuse me, uh, what I'm talking about. Is it Arizona or Arizona State? Yeah, Arizona State. Sorry, my notes were all over the place. Uh, Arizona State, while their offense has been horrible, that the defense has actually been pretty solid. We saw that against Colorado holding Shadur Sanders to under 300 yards total. Um, I think Arizona State's defense shows up. It's kind of like a letdown spot for Washington after that emotional win against Oregon. You know, do they have? Do they really want to win this game in blowout fashion by 28 plus? Maybe, but I, I just don't think it's a game we see Washington's offense go off. I think they score 30 points. I still think that gives us under this total because I don't think Arizona State does much of anything offensively. They haven't been able to do so all year, scoring 19 points per game. They've had under 100 rushing yards in the last four games, and they played some of the weaker Pac-12 defenses. Still hasn't mattered. I think we see an under all the way. Uh, I, I really like this under here. It's one of my favorite totals on the board. I'm actually giving it out tomorrow on the uh, rundown video as well. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm Kim going to say this against Washington. I'm going to look at Arizona State and the points. Um, I don't, I don't knock it. Yeah. You know, Arizona state, we saw this matchup last year and granted Arizona state was in a much better position than they were this season. Still covered and only losing by a touchdown is 13 and a half point dogs. And, you know, I think it's, it's just worth taking into consideration. I believe Michael Penix jr. Was banged up in the end of that game. He's probably, he's probably gonna be fine. Um, but yeah. it wouldn't surprise me here if Kalen DeBoer kind of took him out a little bit early if the, if Washington's up comfortably, you know, Jalen McMillan right now, questionable for this game with an undisclosed injury. But the thing that stands out to me here is that if there's one area where you really want to attack Arizona State's defense, it's on the ground. Um, you know, they're top 40 in rush defense, but it, it just it doesn't feel like it. I just walk, just with an eye test and just watching this game. But this is a Washington team that likes to air it out. They lead the country in passing yardage. But one of the best units on the field is going to be the Arizona State secondary. I like what I've seen from this secondary from Arizona State. And don't get me wrong. I think Washington's going to have their big plays in this game. And I think they're going to be able to put up some points. But I could see a 38-14 to 14 kind of game. Or maybe even 38-10. And at the number at 27.5, it probably leans towards Washington. But even then, I still, I just, I don't think that there's enough to, to push this one up over four touchdowns. I because I, I, I'm seeing 28 and a half now, and that's why I said 38, 10, and I see the graphic on the screen says 27 and a half, but I'm seeing 28 and a half pop up as well. And if it stays at 28 and a half, if you're getting another key number, I think it's it's hard not to look at Arizona State here. Um, Washington State, I, I'm not saying they don't need the style points here, but they're in the driver's seat in the Pac-12 right now after that win over Oregon. So I, 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 I lean towards Arizona State in the points in this one. But, um, yeah, I think that does it. That's all the games we have. Anything else, Ron, that kind of stands out for you on the board this week? I know you're going to have your rundown for college football tomorrow. But uh, Yeah, a lot of the games we went over today are actually going to be on the rundown tomorrow. But, um, yeah, no no other games that I'm, like, looking, dying to talk about. Um, I think we went over all the marquee matchups and some of, like, that, that Mac game. Is, I'm glad we talked about that one because – you know, even though it's you know two unranked teams in a weaker conference, it still should be a great game between the two the best teams in that conference. And really excited to watch that one at uh, four o'clock Eastern on ESPNU. Yeah, I see. Weird P3 time. In, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, P three in the comments saying, "What do you what do you guys say about Auburn and Ole Miss?" Ugh, that's what I say about that game. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. It is a tough one. It's just been two really inconsistent teams this year. You never know what you're going to get from either of them, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, I lean towards Ole Miss laying the points there. Um, other than that, because I, I, I don't know. I don't love Auburn, but I don't know. That, that line just feels really funky. Um, and yeah, I might lean the other way just because I just don't love Ole Miss on the road. I yeah, mean, fair we enough. saw at Alabama what happened. And at Tulane, they earned the big win. But the, I think Tulane, you know, Pratt was out for that one, right? So. Yeah, doesn't really impress me. They only outgained it by twenty yards, so I worry about Ole Miss on the road. Yeah, 
I'll take two. I'll take two more little comments here from the from the from the comment section, and we'll call it. But anything on Mizzou, South Carolina, Ron? I like Mizzou, but I just don't think we're getting the best number because of what we've seen from Mizzou lately. You know, like last week with the blowout win um, at Kentucky. So I think Mizzou is the better team um, by a pretty significant margin. South Carolina's defense just hasn't held up, and I don't love them on the road. But like I said, we're laying now seven points. Uh, without that, uh, you know, now Missouri's ranked because of that win against Kentucky. So it's just we're not getting the best price we could have gotten if some of the results changed. If South Carolina were to hang on against Florida and if Missouri lost a close one at Kentucky, we might be getting the Tigers at, you know, laying two and a half for three points. But now at a full touchdown, uh, not my well, favorite. And I will say at every book that I'm looking at right now, it's at seven and a half. Yeah, so there you go. You know, even worse. So Yeah. And last one, this one's, this one's directly – message to you ron eastern michigan is a dog plus 11 and a half against northern illinois i can't get there I, i'm really not i mean i think when you look at winning teams in college football this year eastern michigan's the worst winning team in college football and they have a winning conference record as well i think emu is the worst team in the mac even worse to kent state and i know emu just beat kent state and covered but i don't think they deserve that win when you look at that game and and the yardage and you know kent state tried an onside kick at the beginning of that game went for a touchdown for emu kent state had so many chances to win that game it was you know bad play calling and and, and special teams but emu going forward i'm looking to fade them and that includes this game against a uh, surging niu team yeah I'm, i think the only match i'm interested in keeping an eye on is that toledo um miami ohio game this weekend but um, yeah, but i will say you know, to contradict what I just said, EMU has been a absolute cash cow as a road underdog. So, uh, you know, they, I, I forgot, I don't know what the record is offhand, but I, it's somewhere in that like 26 and five range, uh, mostly non-conference games, but even in the Mac, they've just been so strong as a road dog. So I, I wouldn't knock anybody for taking them. I just think that the team itself, the weakest we've seen in a while. Yeah, not for sure. But uh, anyways, thank you guys so much for, for tuning in. I appreciate you guys for joining us. I'm sure Mitch will be back to uh, to get us back to the uh, the Colorado slander last week. That was the joke I made with Jay this morning. I said, of course, the one week that Mitch is out, it's a Colorado bye week conveniently. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, but uh, yeah, thank you guys for joining us. We're going to have Ron's rundown. You say tomorrow it's going to be up? Yep, for college football night. Tomorrow night. Um, I'm going to have some college football videos up as well tomorrow. Uh, Mitch is, well, I think Mitch is already done, so he'll have his up as well, so... Definitely uh, make sure you check those out and check out our college football show on Saturday. Uh, I shouldn't say college football, our weekend show Saturday. Ron, are you going to be there as well? Yep, I'll be there. So Ron and I will both be there on Saturday. Um, then we're going to have our show Saturday morning with the sauce as well right after that. So definitely make sure you tune in. Lots of college football action this week, and we'll, uh, we'll get you guys covered for that one. But uh, 